is a tremendous opportunity for all of us, and I hope you read his, his bio. Uh, it is so incredibly impressive, and we're very fortunate to have him. So, Dr. Brown, please come back. I do want to say I'm, I'm actually structured this with a lot of PowerPoints, so it's going to be helpful if you can actually read the PowerPoints. So I'm sort of speaking to the people in the back because I'm not sure if they can read them from way back there. So I'm kind of inviting you to move forward uh, before I get started. So I'm sorry, this is where you guys get up and walk. <laughs>
that just if the Marxists were successful <coughs> and they were able to bring about the workers' paradise, there would still be racism. Um, so we never really saw the notion that racism being a part of the economic system. Um, instead, what we think these critics are really trying to do, in part, is to whitewash uh, American history. They're, they're trying not to allow further discussion of American history and, and just, just how much racism, oppression, uh, subordination exists there. Um, so I'm not going to talk to you about this defensively. Um, I'm going to talk to you about it as someone who was there. But I'm also going to talk to you about it as an Indiana native. Um, so I really want to talk about it in, in the sense also that I grew up here. <coughs> my experiences being a part of it would have been similar to yours if you had been there in those meetings. Um, now, one of the early famous CRT articles was one written by Mari Matsuda, and was entitled, Looking to the Bottom. In this article, what she argued was that one's view about race, race discrimination, and racial oppression depends upon your location in the socioeconomic hierarchy and the experiences about race that you bring to a particular issue. So in that spirit, what I'm going to do is situate myself with, your, with the audience. I'm going to tell you a little about my background, because I want you to understand where I was coming from, but it'll give you a sense of where all of us were coming from. Uh, and it's always been our understanding, is that your, your view is going to be uh, really impacted uh, by who you are and where you're coming from. So let me, let me start. Um, and let me say this, too. I am not doing this to toot my own horn. I really am trying to do this to let you know, yeah, he really is somebody who's an expert who may not actually know what he's talking about. Uh, I know in our days today, it's kind of hard sometimes to figure out who the experts are for who, who we want. Um, so, Kevin Brown. Uh, I'm an Indianapolis native. Uh, I went to Indianapolis public schools up through the fifth grade. Both of my parents were public school teachers. My dad, in fact, was the head of the math department at Christmas Adams High School in Indianapolis. That was the all-black high school that Indianapolis created. Uh, my mother was a special reading teacher and a first grade teacher in three elementary schools. One of them was one that she attended, just like my father had attended Christmas Adams High School. Um, I graduated from North Central High School in Indianapolis, a suburb of Indianapolis. Uh, went, to, went to Indiana University Bloomington to get my degree in accounting and graduated in accounting in 1978. Um, I then um, graduated from Yale Law School in 1982. Uh, when I finished Yale, I came back to Indianapolis to work for the most prestigious law firm in the state. When I did that, I was the second attorney of color to work at a law firm of any significant size in the history of the state of Indiana. Um, in 1987, or right, 1983, I joined the board of Urban League. 1984, I, I joined the board of Indiana Black Expo. And then in 1987, I went down to Bloomington to become a law professor. Um, I attended the first critical race theory workshop in, in 1989, and in 1991, I then developed the first race and law course in any law school in the history of the state of Indiana. Um, so you get a sense of how recent it has been that we talked about race and law within the context of, of, of law schools. Um, now, at age 65, and that's what I am now, uh, I, mean, I know I'm coming to the end of my academic career. So, you, you know, I'm actually looking back over an academic career where I've published more than 3,000 pages. And I've come to the realization that those first meetings in critical race theory were the meetings that really formed the way I thought about race 
racial oppression, racial discrimination for over three decades. Um, but the thing about having done this for over 30 years now, uh, is, and, and that's where we're at here, we can actually look back. And we could go back to that meeting that we had in 1989. I think what you can realize then is that we knew what we were talking about. Uh, that history has proven our concerns in 1989 to be right. In other words, we were not fools, we were prophets. Um, okay. So, oops. okay, let me, let me give you this. this I, I'm going to give you this as a tentative definition of critical race theory for us to work with. Now, you'll know more by the time I get done, but this will give us some place to start because, see, critical race theory is not a thing. What it is, is it's a, it's a way of looking at American society in order to help people really see the racial oppression that exists in society. Uh, because we think that the problem in American society is that we simply don't understand how deep our history of racism is. And as a result of that, uh, we've generated these significant differences racial disparities in the important socioeconomic conditions of society uh, that have become persistent. So it's really sort of a way of saying, look, let's look at American society this way. You look at it this way, I think you'll be able to see exactly what it is that we're, we're, we're talking about. Um, but I am going to say, say a couple things before I get started. Because I'm going to actually ask you, so this is a warning. I'm going to ask you to think about race race discrimination, and racism in ways that you normally don't, and certainly not in the ways that mainstream American society does. Because after all, CRT is a criticism of the normal ways that we think about racial oppression. Um, the only way we believe our society is going to attack the persistent racial disparities in the important socioeconomic statistics is to think about race in a different way. The other thing I need to tell you, once again, caveat, we were law professors. Therefore, we were speaking to lawyers, judges, law professors, and law students. Let me see if I can put that to you a different way. We were speaking to the people who, in our society, are responsible for the administration of justice. Because what we felt we were talking about was an important aspect of justice. Um, and to make this point as clear, and maybe to give you an example, uh, because I am going to ultimately lay the blame at the feet of the United States Supreme Court. Let me say that again. I'm going to lay the blame at the feet of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, now, changes in law are really brought about for us by the justice system. And, you know, in some sense, I'm, I'm fortunate because I can come to you and say, look, think about the abortion debate that's been kicked off here lately. Whether or not you believe in a woman's right to choose, or you believe it's wrong to innocent, kill innocent children, one thing is clear to all Americans right now, that issue is being decided by the nine people who are on the Supreme Court. They are making that decision for all of us. Because what law does is it says this is what people can do and this is what they can't. In other words, law sets the framework in which all of us then are compelled to live within. So if there's something wrong with the framework, we're going to suffer within it unless we can change the framework. And that really does mean changing the law. And, and, and finally, for the people who talk about the system, they're talking about the legal system. That is the system. I mean, that's the whole point. It sets the framework. So as a law professor, my job's not just to teach law students what the law is, but it's also trying to shape the system, shape the law, especially if the law seems to be unjust in certain areas. 
Um, now, as original critical race theorists, we did include Asian Americans, Neil Gautai, Lamari Matsuda. We also had Latino or Latinx scholars, uh, Richard Delgado and, and Trina Grillo. But our thinking in 1989 was dominated by the black-white paradigm. Okay, I know we're 30 years removed from that original CRT meeting, and right, everybody now looks at it and goes, wow, look how large the Latinx community was. But in 1989, the Latinx community was still something that was in the process of forming. Um, some of you, some of you, some of you, uh, are old enough to remember what it was like in the 1970s before we had a Latinx, Latino, or Hispanic community. Right? What we had in the 70s were Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and Mexican Americans. So even though our federal government had been classifying and maintaining racial statistics for 200 years, it wasn't until 1977 that the federal government came to an agreement on the definition of racial and ethnic groups that we deal with today. It's in that 1977 decision that we come up with this notion of lumping all the people in one category who we now consider to be the Latinx community, just as it's when we decided to lump all the people together and call them Asians. Um, but in addition to that, in 1995, Latino scholars broke away from critical race theory and created another movement called Black Crit Movement. Uh, and the Black Crit Movement focuses specifically on how law impacts the Latinx community. Um, now, to understand CRT, and I mean truly understand CRT, you have to start with where we were in 1989, which means you've got to go back and look at the racial disparities that existed in American society in 1989. Um, so what I'm going to say now is very important, because if you don't comprehend this, you do not comprehend uh, critical race theory. We were not worried about the white racists who stood in the door to keep us from going to universities or to eat at lot lunchroom counters um, or, or to go to public schools. For the most part, we felt that kind of racism had been dealt with with the civil rights laws of the 1960s. What we worried about and what drove us were the racial disparities in the important social economic statistics in American society. Okay, now, and I know that means I gotta talk about statistics, and I know when I talk about statistics, you know, sometimes I get eyes and just glaze over, um, and I always get the other people who are looking, you know, there's statistics, there's statistics, and then there's damn lies, and then there's more statistics, okay? I understand that. But I am asking you, stick with me for a minute here, and, and think about this, what I'm trying to convey, when I try to convey the statistics are the things that people care about. You know, what do you care about? You're going to care about your family. You're going to care about your job. You're going to care about whether or not you're unemployed. You're going to care about where you live and whether or not you own the place that you live in. You're going to care about how much income you have, um, you're going to care, which will include, do I have enough income that I'm, I'm not below the poverty line? You're going to care about wealth, right? Because wealth's significant. That gives you the money that you can pass on to your kids to give your kids a head start. Uh, you're going to care about political power. You're going to care about educational credentials. And you're going to care about the possibility of being sucked into the criminal justice system. You're going to care about your access to medical care. And of course, you're going to care about your life expectancy. So while the stats are stats, stats, when you look at the statistics, when you see the racial disparities in these statistics, I think you quickly realize that people of color, especially black people, are having very different lived experiences in American <coughs> society that are shaped by our society's discriminatory past. Because it means that black people in this society then are not the people, generally speaking, living in the million dollar homes. Uh, that they are struggling economically. <clears throat> they don't have the money for vacations in Europe or for that matter, SAT prep courses and tutors. 
Uh, they don't have the money to pass on to their children to give them a head start in life. They know somebody in their family or friends who've been involved in the criminal justice system or at least had negative experiences with it. Uh, and we see our people uh, who we know lives end sooner. But we really stand by dumbfounded when we hear white politicians look us in the eye and say things like CRT education hurts my children and makes them feel bad because it is obvious that they are oblivious to the very suffering of our children in those educational institutions. Simply put, CRT was concerned that American society had normalized the racial disparities in the important socioeconomic statistics. In other words, American society had gotten to the point where American society really believed black people should have less. And to a certain extent, American society has always believed black people should have less. Um, so let us look then at the, some of the stats that we were looking at in 1989. Uh, when we got to 1989, First thing that we saw was um, the school desegregation had peaked. The school desegregation had peaked in 1981 with 37% of black students and majority uh, white school. Just, just a footnote, I'm absolutely willing to give all of these, this, this PowerPoint to anybody, so I'll make sure they have it here at the Urban League and they can distribute it um, because that was the whole point. Uh, so, so, yeah, you know, there's nothing that I'm saying here <laughs> when she can't go to the New York Times and say he said it. Um, right, that's the whole point. You know, I shouldn't say it if I can't stand by it. Um, um, but the first thing to point out then is um, in, 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 in the, the reason this is important is school desegregation had peaked is because school desegregation really was the number one program that we instituted to bring about racial equality. Um, and, 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 and to point out to you the best American society ever did was to get 37% of black kids in majority white schools. Right, right now, we're at a percentage that's less than where we were in 1968. And of course, no one believes that, that, that school desegregation is even possible anymore. Um, the number of black males who were, going to, who were in prison, incarcerated, increased by 275% in the 1980s. Uh, the homicide rate for blacks doubled in the 1980s. <laughs> Black family income remained at 60% of white family income, just slightly better than it had been 30 years before. Black poverty rates were 31% in the 1980s, which is close to that three and a half to one ratio between black poverty rates and white poverty rates that we've seen since the 60s. So not much change there. There was a slight closing in the ratio of blacks getting college degrees uh, to whites, but it was still two to one, still two to one. Uh, and then Nancy Reagan was telling us just say no to drugs. When John Kerry was testifying in the US Senate about how the CIA assisted in bringing cocaine into the US, that it knew it was headed to black neighborhoods in the form of crack. Uh, but as bad as things looked to us in 1989, 1990 <clears throat> looked to us even worse. Uh, uh, the federal courts were terminating school desegregation. Ronald Reagan, and really in some sense, I, I, a lot of people really Credit Ronald Reagan with the Indian Cold War, think of him as a great president. It is impossible if you were black to think of him as anything other than one of the more racist presidents that we've had. Uh, he gets elected in a landslide in 1984 with 66% of the white vote and 9% of the black vote. And then if you think about 1988, his vice president gets elected with 60% of the white vote and 11% of the black vote. So what that told us was that the federal government was going to be very hostile 
to improvements in the conditions of black people in America. Then we have black conservatives who were criticizing affirmative action and talking about the declining significance of race. And there, there, there were even commentators in the 1980s who were going back to Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech and taking one phrase out of context where King goes, judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And then they were saying, King would be against affirmative action. <laughs> um, but for us as law professors, the US Supreme Court delivered six major civil rights decisions, all of which cut back on rights that black civil rights <laughs> plaintiffs had. Uh, the most significant were the attacks on affirmative action. I'm, I'm going to underscore those. I'm going to underscore the attacks on affirmative action because the United States Supreme Court, this time next year, we will be waiting for a major decision from them on the continuation of affirmative action. And, and, and I want to take great right, right. For us, all of those court opinions were critical, but this one attack in affirmative action, it was an existential crisis to us. Okay, right, because critical race theory, we're coming together, Madison, Wisconsin. This is the first time. This is the first time in the history of American society where you had law professors of color who were in predominantly white schools coming together to talk about race. This was the first time. And we were all the one or one of two professors of color on our faculties. So then to hear them talk about affirmative action might be ruled unconstitutional meant that for us, there wouldn't be any more Scott law professors of color joining our faculties. And there was one estimate in 1991 that we would lose two-thirds of black law students. Let me say that again. Two-thirds of black law students who were in law school would not be admitted to any law school at all without affirmative action. Um, and of course, we're hearing black conservatives talk about the declining significance of race. Uh, this just seemed ludicrous to us. Um, and, and now, uh, everything I've talked about to this point is really just a setup for what CRT is. But my hope is at least in this you can see this was a group of people who were highly motivated to figure out what had happened to America's march towards racial equality. Uh, we, we had looked at this road to racial equality and we're going, it's, it's obviously not going well. So we were going to try to figure out what happened. Now, to tell you what happened means I now have to go to the beginnings of the Civil Rights Movement. And the beginnings of the Civil Rights Movement, I think everybody would agree, uh, is the US Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education that was decided in 1954. And of course, it was decided on May 17th. So we're sitting here today on the anniversary uh, of that decision 68 years ago. And, and, and you know, when I say something about Brown versus Board of Education, right, this is the case where the US Supreme Court is going to strike down segregation statutes. Segregation statutes that existed in 21 states and covered 40% of America's public school students. Uh, but this is also the case that when people talk about notions of America's equality, and they talk about the importance of the court in bringing about equality, everybody points to Brown versus Board of Education. This is, this is the poll star when you talk about the pantheon of racial equality in American society. Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. And, and, and look, there's no question this was a significant decision. There's absolutely no question about that at all. Striking down segregation statutes was a huge step forward. Dare I say a giant leap in our efforts to move towards racial equality. Uh, but I am going to suggest to you in strong terms, this was not a decision that would ever get us there. Um, but I do want to say it was a significant decision. 
So in order to make sure you understand it's a significant decision, what I want to do is take us back to 1954 and think about what American society was like in 1954. Uh, because in 1954, when the court made this decision, um, people of African descent, we were called Negroes, or colored out of respect, and were called coon, darky, and even black as an insult. Neither America nor her descendants from Africa had undergone the civil rights movement, the black consciousness movement, the multicultural movement, the diversity movement. The court's opinion in Brown versus Board of Education preceded by a decade the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is the most sweeping civil rights legislation in our country's history. It preceded by 11 years the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is what gave black people in the South the right to vote because they had been excluded from voting for the entire 20th century. Footnote, obviously they voted in the 19th century, something happened. Um, discrimination uh, in race and employment, merchandising stores, eating establishments, places of entertainment, hotels and motels, <coughs> was a generally accepted fact of life. Uh, black people rarely held positions higher than the most menial positions in American business. And in, in, indeed, what we would come to talk about is the glass ceiling in the 1980s. 1954, this thing was a firmly implanted outright concrete barrier. Uh, so the Supreme desegregation era, um, that decision. And, and, and we are going to look at it today in the cold light of that passage of time. And, and as, I, as I talk about this, Remember the one thing about, about the Supreme Court justices that rendered the opinion in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. All nine, nine white men were born in the 1800s. In other words, they could not escape the racism of their time, even in this opinion. So, so in Brown versus Board of Education, what made this so significant is that the Supreme Court was dealing with a situation where the physical facilities between the black schools and the white schools were equal. So in a situation where you truly, truly have separate but equal, what is wrong with segregation? Now, we might think today, well, it's pretty easy to say that, denial of individual rights. But in 1954, that was not clear at all. So, what I'm going to show you is the exact language of the U.S. Supreme Court about what was wrong with segregation that will start American society on the desegregation movement. And I'm always also going to point out to you, it is in this language that the problem of race today is revealed because it exists in the very opinion that we embrace as the essence of equality. So once again, the court had to decide what was wrong with segregation. And this is what they said. To separate African American youth from others of similar age and qualifications solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in ways unlikely ever to be undone. Segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon the colored children, for the policy of separating the races is usually interpreted as denoting the inferiority of the Negro group. A sense of inferiority affects the motivation of the child to learn. Segregation with the sanction of the law therefore has a tendency to retard the educational mental development of the Negro children. Now, let's go through that just a little slower. The first thing that they're saying about segregation is it is retarded the mental development of black children, and only black children. The second thing, ways unlikely ever to be undone. 
That means for black adults who've already gone through a segregated school system, they are already hopelessly and irrevocably damaged. And the third thing, the way that you solve the problem is you move black people into white spaces. Thus, Brown is thought about as an opinion that makes this historic break with America's past, and it does. It does make a historic break with America's past. It does not reject the notion that black people are inferior. What it does is it rejects the earlier justifications about why black people were inferior. And the earlier justifications were black people were inferior because God had cursed us. And the other arguments about it were biology of black people is so bad that that's what makes them inferior. Now the problem is if you really do believe that blacks are inferior because God has cursed us or, or because of our biology, it makes no sense to try to do anything about it because you can't. But what Brown is saying is no, the problem is that black people have a deficit social environment. You know why they have a deficit social environment? Because white people aren't there. And they have a deficit culture. The way they think is the problem. Um, so comparatively speaking, Brown's a step forward because it does suggest the existence of a solution. But here then is the problem, right? If segregation created these feelings of inferiority for blacks, what was the psychological impact on whites? And the Supreme Court will, in, in, in justifying the statement, they will then go to uh, a brief, a document, filed by social scientists that discuss the impact of segregation on blacks. But they also discuss the impact of segregation on whites. And this did not make it into the court's opinion. So this is what the social scientists said segregation does for whites. The, major the, the children of the majority group who learn the prejudices of our society often develop patterns of guilt feelings, rationalizations, and other mechanisms which they must use in an attempt to protect themselves from recognizing the essential injustice of their unrealistic fears and hatreds of minority groups. Um, and now I want to underscore this rationalization point. I want to underscore this uh, rationalization point as much as I can. Uh, you know, I am a law professor. And I don't care what the standardized test is, whether it's the ACT, the SAT, the LSAT, the MCAT, the DAT, the OAT, the GRE, the GMAT, uh, or in Indiana, the I-Learn, the I-Step, uh, or the I-Core assessments. As well. You see these, these, these racial gaps yes. on all standardized yes. tests. Yes. And what they are doing is rationalizing the argument that black people deserve less. They are saying we're not as intelligent because we don't do as well on the test. Now let, 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 me give you, let me give you an alternative explanation of standardized tests. And, and this, this is an alternative explanation uh, that comes from Justice, Justice Douglas, Justice William Douglas. Uh, Justice Douglas writes this 20 years after Brown. Uh, he was one of the justices on the Supreme Court in 54 and Brown. Uh, and this is what he says. He's, he's now talking about the LSAT. This is a test we use in law school. And he says, since the LSAT reflects questions touching on cultural backgrounds, the admission committee acted properly, in my view, in setting minority applications apart for separate processes. These minorities have cultural backgrounds that are vastly different from the dominant Caucasian. A test sensitively tuned for most applicants would be wide of the mark for many minorities. And he's basically pointing to the fact that the problem with the test is the cultural bias that are in the test. Uh, that you are judging us by a biased standard against us. And therefore, and because we don't do well, that becomes a rationalization for why we shouldn't have more. Um, so, so let me let me talk then or sum this up on the limitations of Brown. 
The limitation to Brown is that the only thing that they said was that segregation harmed blacks. They ignored the harm that segregation did to whites, and they ignored the harm that segregation did to our institutions. I mean, think about this for a second if you think about public schools. Okay, if you really think black people are inferior, that's going to now play itself out in the materials that you present to students in class, how you teach the materials you yeah. present to students in class, who teaches the materials you yeah. present to students in class, how you administrate the materials you teach in class. In other words, this is going to impact the entire institution of public schools. And that for us was always the problem. The problem for us wasn't um, 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 the races of the past. It was the bias that's in our institutions, our institutional practices, as well as this cultural bias, where there's a something that because it's from Western Europe, um, in fact, I was just looking at some standards for sixth grade education, and they're in the standards saying, look, uh, we got to point out that, that our society comes from the Greeks and the Romans. And of course, somebody asked me, well, Kevin, what do you think about this? I said, well, the reason that, that, that Americans said their society came from the Greeks and Romans is because the Greeks and the Romans were the two civilizations that had some form of democracy and slavery. Mm. That's why the connection is made. Um, Okay, but in some sense, that doesn't really answer where we are today, right? Uh, because by the time we get to the mid-1970s, um, <clears throat> this rationale, the Supreme Court's beginning to wane. And they're beginning to move away from what they said in Brown to talk about racial discrimination. And as we start moving into the mid-1970s, the Supreme Court increasingly starts to embrace colorblindness, okay? And it was the understanding of the limitations of colorblindness that was one of the fundamental breakthroughs that we made in CRT. Um, now, colorblindness, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with it, um, maybe not, okay, we're not gonna work that way. Uh, so the colorblind era starts with this idea that the way to deal with racial and ethnic problems is to transcend them, to go beyond them, to deal with people as individuals, uh, that this is the way to handle it. So colorblindness is, is a type of individualism. It's, it's a particular way of understanding individualism. Here's what colorblindness really, really comes down to. It comes down to this notion that deep inside of you is your quintessential self. And you can see where this idea comes from our Christian belief in the soul. That deep inside of you is your quintessential self. And hence your goal is to line up your aspects of your life out here so it's consistent with your quintessential self. Uh, be a lawyer, why? Because that's who you are. Right, live in this neighborhood, why? Because that's who you are. Dress this way, why? Because that's who you are. Right, colorblindness is about self-determination. It privileges self-determination. And, 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 and uh, don't get me wrong, um, man, dealing with a person as an individual is the only way for us to interact as individuals. Right, when I think of my friends on the law school, uh, they're Ken, they're Jeff, they're Joe, right? They're individual. That's how I treat them, that's how we treat each other. That makes perfect sense. There is nothing wrong with the concept of colorblindness when you're talking about individuals getting to know individuals. But when you're talking about colorblindness being used to resolve legal, educational, economic, political, and social issues, it has a completely different in, in, in impact. Um, colorblindness will allow for the production of black individuals who are successful. It will do that. And we've seen that, right? We've seen the Barack Obamas, the Oprah Winfrey's, the Colin Powell's, the, the Williams sisters, Kamala Harris. We've seen that. But as a group of black people, colorblindness freezes into place 
the existing racial disparities. Um, so our criticism in CRT of colorblindness was really one of our fundamental critiques. Um, okay, so we critiqued it. First off, color, color blindness denies the reality of people of color that is shaped by race. Anyway, I'm Kevin Brown. Okay, I went through my whole history to tell you, and you would have walked away from that one. Dang, being black must have really had a lot to do with his life. Exactly. You're going to transcend my race? You're not going to deal with me. You're going to deal with some abstract version of me. But it's not me, because so much of my reality is structured by race. So colorblindness denies the basic reality of people of color structured by race. Second problem with colorblindness. Colorblindness generates this really narrow definition of race discrimination. Because the whole thing is about intentional discrimination. In colorblindness, the only time you have race discrimination is when the discriminator is consciously motivated by a desire to harm others because of their race. But that's just a limited form of racism. There's institutional racism. There's cultural racism. Uh, there's unconscious racism. There's stereotypes. None of that is picked up when you view racism from the perspective of colorblindness. <laughs> the other thing colorblindness does is it now makes the color consciousness actions of people of color racist. And we then become the racist. How many, how many times, I've, I've heard this race in law school all the time, why you got a black student union? You know, why you got a black law professor's group? Why you got a black attorney's group? So all of a sudden, you know, we become the racist because we are acting based on race. And that's because colorblindness says, look, racism is by definition anytime anybody acts motivated by racial considerations. Uh, a third problem with with color blindness, and I, I think everybody knows this one. Man, people just be called racist. You, you, you call someone racist, you are ready for a fight. Oh, yeah. When you call Donald, we call Donald Trump racist. We say, oh, I'm not racist. You know, he, he, right? Because, because within color blindness, racism becomes a moral condemnation. Right? You're doing something evil. And once again, think about this in terms of self determination. Because that was the idea. The idea is that you, sh if, in order for people to be self-determined, you cannot treat them based on a characteristic they don't choose. So us in law, we have heightened scrutiny, that's what we call it, when we're talking about race, gender, sexual orientation, footnote as opposed to sexual preference. Because sexual orientation you don't choose, but sexual preference you do. Um, uh, physically uh, challenged, those are the things that we consider, and ethnicity, that we consider uh, all because those are characteristics that people don't choose. And with this, in this individualism, you're supposed to ignore those concepts. Um, the fourth problem with colorblindness, it discounts the impact of history. If you are self-determined, if you become the person you think you are because of your work, what has history got to do with it? Mm -hmm. But once you underplay history, you've eliminated the reason that black people have less. And once you've eliminated history as the explanation for why black people have less, then you look around and you say, well, there must be something wrong with these black people. And we realize, no, 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 our problem is rooted in history. So to the extent that you deny the impact of history, you deny the very reasons that we are in the situation that we're in. And then finally, colorblindness institutionalizes the impact, the experiences of the majority as the norm. This is the point I was trying to make about what I said about Justice Douglas when he's talking about the LSAT. What Justice Douglas is trying to say is, look, it is the experiences of the majority that get normalized is what's right and therefore they have this huge advantage because their perspective is viewed as the right perspective. And then finally, colorblindness, and here's a, here's a huge one, um, which now brings me back to what I said about 
affirmative action, colorblindness then says policies and programs that governments institute or companies institute to attack racial disparities are just as racist as the policies and programs of segregationists that were used to create the racial disparities in the first place. So you can't institute policies and programs to attack the racial disparities because those then get determined and get called racially discriminatory. And, and remember, I, I, I said, you know, I was going to put this at the blame of, of, of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, these are just some of the opinions that the courts rendered. Um, um, okay, I'm sorry. I don't have that stat. I, I don't have that. That I mean, it's not in here. I'm sorry. So I, I, I gotta give it to you. Right? The Supreme Court is going to write this opinion where they're going to say we reject quotas. Um, so because they rejected quotas, rather than higher education institutions having pro grata percentages of spaces in in higher education institutions for blacks, they now use this affirmative action. So instead of having 12% black students in my law school, we got four or 5%. That's because of the US Supreme Court. Minorities set aside for government contracts. Governments were all beginning to institute policies and programs to set aside governmental contracts because you know maybe 95% of our contracting dollars went to white contractors. We need to set aside 15% for minority contractors. Well, that's racism. So all the minority businesses that didn't, weren't created because uh, of this decision by the Supreme Court. Voluntary school desegregation. I mean, even if you wanted to integrate the schools now, you couldn't do it because the Supreme Court says school integration, where you take account of race and ethnicity of the individual student, is racist. Uh, so the very kind of school desegregation programs that the Supreme Court itself ordered in the 60s and 70s, today the court is saying are unconstitutional because they're discriminatory. Um, indeed, there was this other case where you know black teachers were last to be hired, first to be fired under seniority systems. Mm -hmm. So you had this one school system that said, look, we don't want to fire our black teachers. We need our black teachers to be role models of academic success for our black students. And the Supreme Court said, no, it's not, it's not good enough. Uh, protecting black teachers from layoffs becomes another form of racism. So the problem then, as I said, with the color blindness is it freezes into place the racial inequality. So now we come to the movement, moment where you say, Brown, prove your case. You, you've been telling us this, prove your case. OK, it sounds good, prove it. So here, here, here comes the proof. And remember, the point I've been making is about the racial disparities in the important social economic statistics. So what I'm getting ready to show you is a ton of statistics that are showing you the racial disparities from 1960 to 2020, a 60-year period. And I figured, hey, that makes sense because, you know, um, critical race theory, we meet 1989, so we're roughly in the middle. And remember, our point was, we're looking at the last 30 years, and we're going, whoa, we're not seeing a lot of progress. And then we're looking at where we are in 1989, and we're looking to the future going, and we don't see how we're going to see a whole lot of progress going into the future. So, so what I'm now trying to show you is the progress that the statistics will reveal over the last 60 years. And, and, and you know, I could, you know, I'm just giving you some, right? Because at some point people say, okay, great, you know, man, I'm, I'm sick and tired of them. But I could use a whole bunch of other statistics, but let me start. Uh, let me get that off. Okay, here's median family income. Um, median family income, black and white. And I think you can see this generally uh, goes the same. Um, now, I'm going to give it to you a slightly different way, which will give some progress. Do it here uh, by percentage. So black family income goes from 58% to 64%. Now 64% is really just recently, but that's the best we've been able to do. College degrees. All right, this is people over the age of 25 with college degrees. This is 
This is blacks, this is whites. So you can see right there, it's not like these gaps are closing, they're actually getting wider. But, but um, uh, well, wait, let me just leave that there. Here we go. Uh, poverty rates. Here's the poverty rates over a 60 year period. Yes, yes. All Americans reduce their poverty rates. But see, the gaps are, are, are they, they're, they're a little better. Um, and here's another way to look at it. Here's another way to look at it. You see a little progress there, right? That in the 1960s, it was 3.3. Um, now we get to 2.13. That is, blacks are twice as likely to be below the poverty rate. So there is some improvement there. Unemployment rate. <laughs> this, this, this really does tend to be right. Uh, first hire, last five. I mean, first, last hire, first five. Uh, but, but there is a little improvement here, too, if you think in percentages, which eh, I don't have. Okay. Here's home ownership. <clears throat> I was actually surprised at how stable the home ownership was, especially given the fact that the Bush administration made a whole point. That's the first Bush administration in the 1990s to try to improve black home ownership. Um, well, no, I'm sorry, he did that in 2000. Yeah, I guess that didn't work. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, and there it is. And then here's life expectancy. Um, so there was a closing there in, in 2010, but you can see now it started to expand during the pandemic. And here's another way to look at it in terms of years. So you see, you get down to 3.8 and then it jumps back up to 5. Here's for, here's for males, <laughs> just, just when it comes to life expectancy, it's always worse for males and females. Okay, I'm just saying, I didn't say anything other than that. <laughs> okay, and there it is. And then here's, here's incarceration rates. Uh, and, and keep in mind, there are four times as many white males as black males. So the fact that you got more black males in jail, and even though where one fourth is men shows you how much this is. I have one, one of my friends who's a professor at Harvard. He studies this. You know what he said that this four to one ratio of black males to prison compared to white males starts in the 1870s with the end of slavery. That, that it has been going on in this society for 150 years. Um, yeah, well, okay. I, there's a lot one could say about criminal justice system. Uh, and then this is family wealth. And I couldn't, I, I, we didn't tend to find statistics much before this. Uh, but okay, so, so my hope is, my hope is that you looked at these and you said, you know what, uh, I see what he's talking about, uh, about the maintenance of these, these racial disparities. And now I'm beginning to hear what he's saying, uh, that with colorblindness is our dominant way to think about race. We're not gonna get there. Look, they, 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 you guys are talking about the whole concept of diversity. You're saying, look, no, no, we, we, we got to stop trying to act like we can transcend all these characteristics, and we now need to get Americans to start understanding, okay, people from Japan, people from Korea, people from, from Haiti, people from Mexico, they're different because they're coming with different backgrounds, different experiences than people from America. That it's wrong to say, let's ignore this, let's make them act like us. Uh, effectively, the whole diversity movement is at war with colorblindness. I mean, that's what you're really fighting. You're fighting what, for all practical purposes, is the greatest intellectual fight that you're going to be involved in. I dare say for at least the next 50 years, if not longer, uh, is the fight to say we need to recognize the existence of cultural groups as opposed to the existence of individuals, or at least recognize that the individual is made up of multiple, multiple cultural groups. Not just one, multiple. Um, oh, there it is. This is what I was looking for. One of the Supreme Court. Okay. So, so, so all this now starts to get you there. Hopefully now you start, uh, so now I can go right directly into the CRT positions, because uh, we've got the background. The first thing we were saying in CRT is, look, American society has come to normalize racial disparities. And you really, that, that's the change. That, that's where we were sitting there going, 
what something's really happening is this society really does believe black people should have less. How do we make this society understand that the society believes black people should have less? Because until we can get the society to believe it, black people are always going to have less. Because look, 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 let me stop. I'm a law professor. You want to talk about arguments? This is my job. I teach people how to argue. You know, just the way we do it in law we say, we don't care what you think. What society you want to win? Okay, here are the arguments you can develop. And that's the whole point. If you think this is about arguments, I can tell you, I, I can always give you the arguments that's going to justify it. It's going to try to make it, uh, let me do it better. It's going to try to explain away the differences. Because that's what we do in law school. That's what we train people to do. Uh, you, you should be around when I actually get to debate the anti-CRT people. Uh, but okay, that's a different story. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, okay, we're, we're also saying the society needs racially conscious, motivated, a, a race consciousness motivated by desire to attack the racial disparities, not the older race consciousness that was motivated by desire to create the racial disparities. Um, we also believe that uh, there should be a difference then drawn between policies and programs that are attempting to attack the racial disparities as opposed to policies and programs that uh, so then you should be able from all of this to go, here are the CRT concepts. These are the basic concepts that when you're talking about CRT, people typically point to. Uh, first, interest convergence with its twin racial realism. These are the two that are most connected to Harvard Law Professor Derek Bell. Uh, his interest convergence argument is blacks progress in this society when our interests converge with that of the lead whites. Mm -hmm. that's, his, that's the interest convergence argument. Uh, black progress depends on our interests converging with the elite whites. And of course, if that's the case, his second point, racial realism, is the oppression of black people is permanent. Right? Because if our progress is only going to occur when our interests coincide with elite whites, it means we're kind of screwed. Um, uh, the second, white privilege. Okay, white privilege doesn't mean that because you're white in America, you don't have problems. Right, everybody has problems here, and you're gonna have problems. Right, you're gonna have all kinds of problems. You're gonna have personal problems. You're gonna have employment problems. You're gonna have educational problems. You're gonna have authority. You're gonna have all you have yet. But the privilege you have is white. Is you've got the privilege that you don't have to deal with the continuing effects of America's history of racial discrimination. Yeah, yeah. That's the privilege. The privilege is you don't have to drive worrying about the police stopping you or, or if you're walking through a white neighborhood being stopped because somebody thinks you're out of place. Um, unconscious racism and stereotypes, microaggression and institutional racism, those are all forms of racism which we in CRT say are the main forms of racism that simply are not picked up by our legal definitions of discrimination, which are based upon notions of actions being the product of conscious intent. Um, minority ties people, right, the reason to use that term instead of disadvantaged minorities is to make the point that it's our society that created the concept of minority, right? The people who brought over here from Africa, they weren't even black people, or they didn't see any connection with themselves until they got here. And then they were created, right? African Americans as people only exist, let me, let me make this point clear, African Americans as a people only exist here. No place else in the world will you go and find the concept of all these different people from all over Africa who all of a sudden are seen as one group of people, only here. Um, the need for racially conscious remedies, I think I've said that enough. And then finally discussing history, both that highlights the contribution of minorities and the history of racial oppression. Uh, so to sort of come in, coming now close to the conclusion, um, critical race theory would view racial discrimination in terms of the important socioeconomic issues from a color conscious perspective of attempting to dismantle the continuing structures of racial oppression in our society. 
And we got to start with the recognition of our history of racial discrimination because that is the cause of the disparity. And I, this is where it's really important where we don't disagree. I am not saying that there is a single white person today who is living who is responsible for slavery or segregation or even the discrimination. This is a societal problem that we have all inherited from our historical past. You know, every time I talk about race uh, in, 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 my, in, 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 in Bloomington, in my, in my law school courses, uh, one of the things I point to is I point to this, 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 this statement that Jesse Jackson made once. Jesse Jackson said, look, you know, one of the things I hate about myself is that when I'm at a bank machine and I'm pulling money out and I hear somebody behind me and I turn around and I see it's not a black male, I feel relieved. And the point is what Jesse Jackson is saying, look, is this problem of racism is a problem that's impacting all of us. It's not that it impacts whites and not black, it impacts all of us because we're all victims of this history of racism that we have inherited. And the only way to stop the perpetuation of these beliefs is for us to be conscious about it and to consciously reject them. Um, Five minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let me. Let me. Let, let me. Yeah, let me all right. Then. Okay. I think. All right. All right. All right. All right. So this is really quick, and this has to be quick. Um, but I was asked to do to do quick touching on on teaching of American history. Um, you got to stress the history of racial oppression because if you don't, Americans don't understand how we ended up in the society that we ended up with. And because they don't understand it, then they blame black people. They say there's something wrong with us. But then you've also got to talk about how black people have struggled against the oppression. Because otherwise, you get, here's what you get. You get kids, you get people coming out of school where they never really talked about it. And now they're dealing with their black friend who's 25 years old, and they're saying the black friend hates, and the black friend now talking about racism, black friend never talking about racism when we were in high school. Well, yeah, that's because you never talked about it in high school. Um, but you've got to talk about it. You've got to talk about the struggle. You've got people to understand it. Um, the other thing you have to do, um, oh man, I have to do this too. Um, when I talk about the struggle, okay, so, so this, I, I would take this, this is a privilege that I have to take. Because to me, one of the most important moments to, to really focus on is the Civil War. Okay, is the Civil War. Now, I'll let you go with your dominant explanation of the Civil War, and I'll leave it alone. I'll just say, take whatever you think. This is how I present the Civil War to my students. I first talk about the fact that both Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant are going to both say over and over again, Without the black troops, we could not have won the war. Okay, now think about that. Because this is, this is the record. 85% of eligible black males in the North fought for the North. By the end of the war, blacks were 13% of the Union Army and 25% of the Union Navy. Blacks were 10% of the Union war dead, even though they could not participate until 1863, because the notion was we don't want them to participate, because after all, the war is about union. Just a footnote, here in Indiana, the reason we got a statue down there, if you ever go to look at Governor Oliver Gordon, there's a statue for him in front of the state house. The reason is because there were people in Indiana who, once Lincoln said, I'm going to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, they said, we want out of the war. We can fight a war for union, but we don't want to fight a war to free these black people. And Oliver Morton basically said, look, I'm not going to call the legislature into session to prevent that from happening. But, but you're watching it in Ukraine. Think about it in Ukraine. Right? If you're Ukrainian, you ask the Ukrainian, why are you fighting? The Russians, the devil say, because the Russians are here. We've got a reason to fight because it's our home. The Russians are here. You ask the Russians, why are you fighting in Ukraine? I don't know. Putin asked me to fight. It was the same with the North. Think about what you're asking the Northern troops to do. We want you to go die for union. We want you to die so Mississippi and Alabama are part of the country. Oh, why the hell? Why do I care? Let them go free. I don't care. But once you put those black troops in, they care. 
they care. Casualty rates for black troops, 40% higher. And, and just as a funny note, I don't know what you think about Ulysses S. Grant. I'm going to tell you the reason Ulysses S. Grant, look, Ulysses S. Grant died. There were 1.5 million people who came to his funeral. If you think about that in today's terms, that's 10 million people. You think about the American, where 10 million people would show up at their funeral. We don't think that Grant is so great. Why is that? You know what Grant did? Grant supports the 15th Amendment. That's the amendment that gives black males the right to vote. Grant's administration passes five major civil rights bills, more than Johnson, who passed four. Grant is going to use the federal troops to put down the Ku Klux Klan in South Carolina, and Grant creates the Department of Justice for the purpose of going after the Klan because they're interfering with the rights of black people to vote. The reason Grant's not thought of as a great president is because all he did for black people, he gets reinterpreted as they reinterpret this, the, the, okay, 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 we can turn, okay, I got to <laughs> so, A couple things. One is, apparently, if you want a copy of the slides, put your email on those forms, and when you turn those in, and then you will be able to get a copy of those. Uh, secondly, it is, uh, it is time to go for lunch, but I'm sure if uh, you want to stay and answer a couple questions, uh, you can be free to go if you have to, or take a few minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah. very, very much so.